Last video, I went on a bit of a crusade to uncover the ingredients behind the most popular beer in America, Bud Light. And while that quest turned up a lot more marketing drivel than hard data, one of the best numbers I learned while creating that video was that Bud Light, a single brand of beer, holds command of 15.4% of the entire US domestic beer market. And although that isn't as dominant as Budweiser at the peak of its popularity, Bud Light is an absolutely crazy big brand, despite the fact that we live in the golden age of craft beer. But this dominance is a little strange. Products that are normally marketed as diet are usually niche products in other industries, not the dominant players. So how did Bud Light come to dominate the US beer market, and are they starting to slip? That's what I aim to find out today. Hey, this is Ryan with Beer by the Numbers, and light beer is an absolute phenomena here in the United States. Three out of the top four selling brands here in the US are light beers, and those three brands represent more than a quarter of the beer market. But how did a diet product become so popular in the first place? And who are the individuals responsible for this market takeover? Well, we're going to get to all this and more today, but before we do, be sure to smash that like button down below and ensures good beer will be in your future. Let's get started. If you looked at light beer marketing today, you may have seen Miller refer to its Miller Lite brand as, quote, original light beer. And while Miller Lite is certainly the earliest popular light beer brand, like most marketing taglines, it's a little bit misleading. The true original light beer was developed in 1967 by Dr. Joseph Owadis, a biochemist at Rheingold Brewing Company uh, he formulated that beer with reduced carbohydrates and calories by removing starch from their original recipe. Starches are large molecules used by cells to store energies for later. Plants make glucose, a sugar molecule, during photosynthesis, but they don't need all the energy provided by that sugar right away. Now, normally you'd think they'd just make a big pile of these sugar molecules inside their cell walls and come back for them later when they're needed. But on a cellular level, sugar is actually pretty dangerous to keep around. Sugar is a very soluble molecule. That's why it's so easy to mix into coffee or tea. But as such, it tends to attract a lot of nearby water molecules from the air. If you're a plant cell with too many sugar molecules lying around, you're gonna to get totally assaulted by way too many water molecules until you swell up and burst, essentially drowning yourself by having too many sweets lying around. To avoid this fate, plant cells fuse a few of these sugar molecules together into a starch, which is much less soluble than the pure sugar molecules in the first place. Plants that have a lot of starches, like barley, are great for making beer with. Boiling all those starch molecules provides a ton of sugar for yeast to ferment into alcohol and carbon dioxide. But not all starches can be eaten by yeast, and those leftover molecules make it into the final beer. Normally these starches and carbohydrates add some pretty nice flavor and a little bit of body to the beer, but they also add quite a few extra calories to your beer gut at the same time. That's why Dr. Oates was targeting starches in beer when he was trying to create a diet beer product. And a diet beer product was actually a pretty brilliant thing in the late 60s. Diet foods were just starting to take off and over the next few decades, they would evolve into a crazy huge industry in the United States. Hell, by the early 2000s, there was a reality show that lasted 17 seasons solely dedicated to people losing weight. So seeing this trend in the late 60s was basically crystal ball worthy. That first light beer was dubbed Galbringer's Diet Beer, and it was introduced to market and it flopped horribly. Rheingold just didn't know how to market this beer, or it seems beer in general, as shortly after their diet beer was introduced, the whole company folded. So Oates took his recipe to another brewery, Chicago-based Meister Brown. Meister Brau relaunched the beer as Meister Brau Light, which did have some minor success. But again, the brewery that housed the world's only light beer went belly up, but this time Miller swooped in and bought three of Meister Brau's brands, including Meister Brau Light. Now Miller did reformulate the beer a bit, so while they can't take credit for inventing the first light beer, they definitely have credit for inventing 
an entire marketing segment for it. Miller teamed up with New York ad agency McCann Erickson, and the two companies worked on a very carefully coordinated launch of Miller Lite to ensure light beer was done right this time. McCann Erickson did their research, and they found the fundamental flaw of how Gablingers and Meisterbrow marketed their light beer options. Health-conscious consumers weren't looking for diet beer. They were staying away from beer in general. So marketing to them, like the previous companies did, was not going to work no matter how hard they tried. But one group did respond well to the idea of diet beer, and it was one group that no one really expected. Sports watching couch potatoes and bar flies. Now no one expected that these heavy beer consumers wanted anything new out of their beers, but it's these consumers that stood to gain the most from having a light beer option. If you could cut 40% of the calories from something you drink several times a week or even daily, that's a pretty good proposition for you. And any marketing firm knows that there's one surefire way to appeal to this TV-loving demographic. Marketing with sports programming. Miller began producing the legendary TV commercials featuring retired athletes like New York Jets 1969 Super Bowl star Matt Snell, who touted the beer for its full flavor but feather light fullness factor. Miller Lite was doing its initial field tests in 1973, and this sports-based marketing campaign was so successful that by 1975, just two years later, Miller Lite was the number two selling beer brand in the country. Miller's main competitor, Budweiser, was tired of losing market share, so they quickly brought their own beer, Natural Light, onto the market in 1975. And they basically copied the Miller Lite model, paying stars like Mickey Mantle to promote their beer, encouraging drinkers to switch from Miller Lite for the better taste. Next came Michelob Lite, and then the regional brewers got in on the action. Soon, every nationally recognized brand had some sort of corresponding light version of their beer, as heavy beer drinkers loved these lighter versions. Finally, in 1982, Budweiser introduced its third light beer, and this beer would come to dominate the market over the next few decades, Bud Light. Bud Light began with the standard sports-based marketing, but quickly differentiated itself using humor and advertising. Who could forget the classic and slightly absurdist mascot Spuds McKenzie, who's making his, like, fifth appearance on this channel? And although I'm a little young to remember Spuds commercials, I do remember the great radio ad campaign, Real Men of Genius. Bud Light presents Real Men of Genius. Real Men of Genius. Today we salute you, Mr. Pro Sports Heckler Guy. Mr. Pro Sports Heckler Guy. They say those who can't play, coach. Apparently those who can't coach sit 30 rows back, shirtless, shouting obscenities. Oh, that's right, mother Thanks to you, our team is armed with game-winning tips like catch the ball and throw it. Shout it out now. You stink. That sucks. What a bunch of losers. Not just catcalls, but subtle psychological ploys to prod your team to victory. Reverse psychology. So here's to you, old Sultan of Shouting, because while there may be no I in team, thanks to you, there's always an F and a U. Bud Light Beer, Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis, Missouri. And while that marketing prowess has lasted up until today, with their latest Dilly Dilly campaign becoming something of a viral hit, and it's all this creative and well-targeted marketing that have allowed Bud Light and other beer brands to dominate the U.S. beer market. Today, Bud Light controls 15% of the market, alone with Coors and Miller Lite, having 8 and 6% respectively. And although these brands are beginning to lose ground as more consumers are looking for local or quality-oriented beer products, there is no doubt that these brands completely changed beer and beer marketing in the 20th century. So what's your favorite light beer, or have you totally sworn off them altogether? Let me know down in the comments section below. And while you're down there, be sure to check out the link in the description to the Beer by the Numbers Facebook page to get some channel updates and some beer news. Once again, this has been Ryan with Beer by the Numbers, and I'll be back next week with more, less filling beer content.